California is clearing homeless camps more often. Not everyone is happy. What? How come? Let's get into it. Here we go. Right, we're reading from Hot Air today. It took nearly a year for the city of Oakland. Oh, let, let's let you look at that encampment. Good Lord, look at that. That's a building, a rooftop of a building there. I mean, the, <laughs> look at this. That is just atrocious. Took nearly a year for the city of Oakland to clear out one of the largest homeless encampments in the state after multiple problems, including fires at the 40 acre site beneath a freeway. The city announced last summer that residents had five days to vacate the property, which was owned by Caltrans, and then residents of the camp sued. A group of encampment residents sued Caltrans, the governor of Oakland, and a number of public officials in federal court, alleging that their forced removal from the site would constitute an unconstitutional state-created danger and place them at a high degree of risk because there were not adequate shelter options for them in Oakland. That case was assigned to Judge Oreck, who expressed concerns about the short notice and lack of shelter options. Okay, yeah, that is an issue. Now, if people took housing as an option, if that was the only real issue, I wouldn't have a problem with it. These people want to keep doing their drugs, period. It is, this is not about housing. So all the housing in the world does not matter. Now, the problem with that is since they're not going to go into shelter, they're just going to move around the corner and you've got the whack-a-mole game, right? I mean, that's literally what you've got. You know what? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show you guys that last part of the article. Sorry about that. Here it is. Uh, now you can read that while I'm, you can catch up. I'm sure you can do that. That injunction was removed. Uh, he issued a temporary injunction on July 19th, 2022. So this is summer ago. So a year ago, that injunction was removed by August of 2022, and the city began to clear the camp. But some of the residents just moved to another site nearby. I mean, that's what they do, right? As you do. Keep doing your drugs. Stay local. You know, keep it, you know, keep it local. But some of the residents just moved to another site nearby. This one owned by the city of Oakland. Excellent. I mean, you know, why wouldn't our taxpayers' dollars or Oakland residents' dollars go towards the maintenance of a parcel, which people are squatting on. In December, the city once again gave notice. So December of 2022, the city once again gave notice of intent to clear it. And once again, someone in the camp sued. You know, it's not somebody in the camp. It's somebody from like uh, the ACLU. It's just like, oh, we, we can't have that happen. It's some activist. It's like these poor people, they just need more sandwiches and tents. <laughs> more affordable housing, of which very few of these actually go into. Very few of them ever accept long-term housing. That's because they, you know, there's rules associated with it. They can't bring, you know, whomever in. They can't have their drug buddies over. They can't party like rock stars. And so that's why they stay in the tents. I mean, it's simple as that. Another temporary restraining order was issued and then later removed. The last part of the camp was finally cleared out in April. So this whole notion of having housing available, these people don't go into housing. They pick up camp, they leave their crap behind, and by crap, I mean their needles, human feces, urine, urine in bottles, broken bicycles, propane tanks, tents, dirty clothes, dirty food, rotting food, rats, infestation, rat tunnels underneath the tents. I mean, it's horrific. If you've been to an, an encampment that's been cleaned out, you're like, okay, was the dump here? I mean, what happened? This looks like the dump. You know what I mean? Not a transfer station, an actual dump with seagulls. That's how I really quantify you're at the dump or not. If you got seagulls flying around, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they're kind of gross birds anyway. Are they protected? Probably. I don't even know. Clearing the camp turned out to be a massive effort for the city. Ultimately, they removed 300 tons of trash and 29 vehicles. Oh, I forgot to talk about stolen vehicles, stolen goods, stolen good, uh, you know, stolen guns, trafficking of women. I mean, you know, you got it all in these encampments. 
trafficking of, of, you know, stolen goods just all day long. 29 vehicles. Yesterday, the New York Times published a story about the removal of the camp on Wood Street. Resi- that's the Wood Street encampment. Residents installed solar panels, hot water showers, a community garden, a kitchen, a clothing closet, and with help from community volunteers, tiny homes. They made their own. Some traded goods and electronics. Others did each other's hair and nails. They had Christmas and birthday parties. That was kind of the organized section of this, right? I mean, there was a little spot of it that was, this is, this is 40 acres. It's a big parcel. The rest of it was just, woof, yeah. Some also took drugs together. What? Hey, now, come on. And when campers overdosed, their neighbors tried to help them. Former residents said there also were thefts, shootings, and according to the California Department of Transportation, which owns a portion of the land, more than 200 fires. We had a doozy of an explosion. Uh, we had um, literally homemade bombs detonating in between the freeway and Harborview Medical Center. It's a trauma, regional trauma center. It's a drug dealer tried to murder 20 people that were smoking fentanyl in a tent. And um, yeah, so that's a storyline that's going on right now. Now, uh, that encampment was starting to be rebuilt, and I think the city swooped in and said, this is an emergency. We're clearing this bastard out. And so I think that happened yesterday, but I've got a video out on that that, um, that for me has done very well. I think we're at, I don't know, we're, I think we're approaching a quarter million views, something like that. So that's been, uh, it's been one of those stories. What's interesting about that one, and what I was going to say is that, hey, you know, does this encampment have a swimming pool? Because if they don't, we had one in Seattle that, you know, got you beat blind. It was a uh, on Myers Way in camp, but they had a swimming pool in there. If you've been following this channel, you heard me talk about <laughs> a swimming pool in an encampment. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, things do get warm, right? Man, one of the stories I was seeing this morning um, was the uh, Arizona has had I believe now it's 32 straight days of 110 degree plus weather. Can you imagine being an illegal immigrant coming through 110 degree weather? I mean, you know, I I want to see immigration reform happen. But, you know, just the humanity of having these people and and, and it's starting to spike back up. Having these people walking through the border, I mean, those conditions are atrocious. So we joke about a swimming pool and an encampment. You know, those people aren't dealing with 32 days of, you know, extreme temperatures. Even the cacti in, uh, in, in Phoenix are dying. I mean, you got some, you got some, you got some temperatures. Those people walking through that, I mean, what a brutal experience. Oh, I think got to do something down there. Nearly 100 residents of the former camp accepted some kind of help, but the Times spoke to one person who accepted help but wasn't happy about it. Okay. John Janosko recently moved into a tiny cabin in Oakland, California, after the city and the state shut down the sprawling homeless encampment where he'd resided for most of the past eight years. Anywho, city officials considered the shed uh, shed size unit um, with a bed, a folding chair, a desk, and a main fridge, a vast improvement over the makeshift shelters that once sat beneath a, fri- a, a freeway. That's not how Mr. Janosko sees it. He says he does not have keys to the free cabin. Okay, so you can't lock it up. Somebody else can that the city is temporarily assigned to him, nor is he allowed visitors, okay? And he had to get rid of most of his belongings, and he says he has barely slept there. What he's not saying is he can't do drugs there, or he doesn't want to. He wants to go back to the tent. He spent eight years there. That's his home. That's where he wants to be. And it's gone, and now he's pissed. So this is the common story of what everybody says, well, we just need to get them temporary housing. They're not going to take it. And they're, even if they do short term, they're not going to take it long term. So that is a total misnomer that you need to have housing for all these people because they're not going to go into it. They're not going to go into it. And yet 
like here in Seattle, King County Regional Housing Authority says, well, we got to offer them housing. I get that. But, you know, you got to do a sweep too. So, you know, take your pick. And bottom line is, is even if you have rules on your books, let's be honest, these folks aren't accepting housing. They're just simply not. It's not my home, said Mr. Janosko, 54, who lost his job as a chef. And then his apartment of almost a decade ago. My home was down the street. Okay. But what happened that you lost your job and what happened then that you couldn't get another job as a chef because, you know, people still eat, you know, it's, it's a decade later, people are still eating. So they need chefs out there making food. What happened there? And his part, and then he lost his apartment. What happened? I'd be curious to know, you know, what happened? Janosko apparently wasn't just a random resident. He was an unofficial spokesperson at the early, as the earlier story points out. It's hard to show people how great this place was, said John Janosko, a spokesman for the Wood Street Commons, as residents refer to themselves. <laughs> they built a whole community. It was that big. And the community they established over many years of living together. As a holiday party and art sale they had in December, residents talked about how they supported one another and how Wood Street has become a central place where health services and donations can reach unhoused people who need them. Okay, but this is totally unsanctioned and massive amounts of criminal activity happened there. That's what we're not focusing on. We are focusing on the activist storyline. Hey, they had Christmas parties. You know, they, they had dance-a-thons. <laughs> you know, I'm making stuff up. But what about the women who were physically assaulted in that encampment? Because that goes on 24-7. Because there's no retribution for it. Yeah, you're not going to go after anybody in these encampments. And they're not going to get caught. You know, what about all the drugs that have been done? How many ODs did you have? How many fires were set? You know, just all of this ridiculousness. That's what this storyline, you know, is kind of touching on, trying to make it seem like, well, they're mostly nice people. You know, they have Christmas parties and whatnot. Yeah. You want to spend a night in one? Go for it. You can report back the next morning. Let me know how it goes, right? If they want to help, said Janosko about the city, why don't they just go to these encampments a year before they have to do all this? Well, they do. And they ask you to leave. And you say, no. And they go through the steps, getting the encampment cleared. Janosko is among the residents who accepted the offer of a spot in the new city-run community cabin site to make sure he could keep his dogs, he said. And the city spokesperson said there's plenty of capacity there still. Why is that? There's plenty of capacity, and yet you've got thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people living outside in tents. Why is that? Hmm. Yeah. Because they don't want to be in, in city-run shelters. They don't want to be in a place where there's actual accountability and rules. If you're not detecting much gratitude from Janosko for his free place to live with his dogs, I'm not detecting it either. That's what the author is saying. On the contrary, one commenter called his attitude the most striking part of the story. What struck me in the article was the attitude of Mr. Janosko, who's complaining about a free place to live. Right? I mean... Literally, that's what he's, ah, yeah, you know, F the cabin. I, I don't have keys. I can't have friends over. What he's not saying, hey, we can't do drugs. We can't sell drugs. We can't do all the stuff we could do in the encampment. I don't want to stay there. Part of the homeless problem is the attitude of the homeless themselves, who seem to think that free everything is a basic human right. If that attitude is widely shared, problems of the homeless will never be solved. Huh. Really? All right. Not only is Janosko not thankful for what he's personally being given, he doesn't seem to appreciate the massive expense his experiment in communal living has cost the city. Of course not. Could give a crap less because these people are not working. They're not paying taxes. They're not funding anything. They are a resources suck and a bad one at that. What it did cost to send the fire department, what did it cost to send the fire department out to deal with 200 fires? How many police calls were there? You know, what did it cost to clean up 300 tons of trash? Yeah. How much? I know at my transfer station, it costs, I think, a 128 bucks, maybe 135 bucks for a ton. So you got 300 tons of trash. I mean, that is, that is some disgusting stuff. 
You go to look at uh, We Heart Seattle, and they will tell you how many you know pounds they've got a meter on their We Heart Seattle. You can go there and donate, and they've got a meter of how many pounds of garbage they have picked up for free for the city of Seattle. Yeah, I mean that's that's an organization I can get behind, and they do a bunch of outreach and. Andrea Suarez is great. So that 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 is somebody that I can literally get behind as far as outreach and activism, but it's activism in a way that is it makes a difference and it's you know, it actually does something. Hey, you cleaned that up so that next time that they crap all over it, you can go back and do it again. But if somebody doesn't do that, I mean, the area just gets worse, right? So they're continually out there doing outreach, picking up garbage, rinse, repeat. Someone is paying for all of this. What exactly do we owe to people who live off others through either kindness or theft? A reader from Denmark had an interesting take. All right. I live in the largest city in Denmark, roughly the same size as Seattle. In a typical month, I see probably 20 homeless people. When I visit Seattle, I see that same number in about two hours. (laughs) That's two hours? What about like the first 15 minutes? I mean, if, you, if you're in a car, you need five minutes. If you're walking, 15 minutes tops. Two hours? Man, you must have been in the good part, right? You must have been in the good part. That despite the fact that the average cost of housing in Copenhagen is higher than in Seattle. I was in Copenhagen in 1986. I was on a track team. We were competing throughout Europe. And um, yeah, Copenhagen in Denmark, cool town. I remember, (laughs) here's the one thing I remember about Copenhagen. I'm like 17, right? And we're out going to a bunch of different countries. We went into Russia, um, St. Petersburg, Leningrad. Um, One thing I remember about Copenhagen is they had free condoms everywhere. And I was like, hey, that's weird. Back in Bellevue, we, we don't have that. Hey, this is different. Cool city, though. We were there during the summer, great weather, beautiful architecture. You know, it was clean. I remember it being very clean. Yes, part of that is because of Denmark's generous social safety nets. The government has built effective social housing and drug treatment centers integrated pretty much seamlessly into the city so that people can get help within their communities. A single-payer health care system means that cost is not as much of a barrier to accessing these services. Housing vouchers prevent people from slipping into homelessness. So they've got, but you've got way greater taxation and you've got more of a social type deal than you do straight up capitalism. But you've also got built in systems that the U.S. does not have. And that's why these folks are falling through the cracks, because so much of this is based on drug addiction. And then they become homeless, don't have a place to stay, and they end up in a tent doing this kind of shenanigans. So unless you incarcerate these people, and a lot of folks will say, hey, the only place you're going to get sober is, you know, prison. It's like, okay, all right, those are not great options. Because I think a lot of people, they need treatment. But, you know, if you're on the drugs that are out there today, you're not going to volunteer for treatment because the detox of that is so horrific. And people do not want to go down that road. So they just keep doing what they're doing. And yeah, here we are, right? Part of that is also because the Danish authorities, here we go, crack down on homeless populations, sometimes rather ruthlessly. Okay. But they don't have much in the way of homelessness, and people either go get the you know mental health they need, or they get the addiction services that they need, or you know they get those squared away. They've got housing to go to. Panhandling is illegal. All right, okay. Encampments are illegal. Uh oh, uh oh. Now, oof, yeah, we are. We're getting into territory where the U.S. is entering now. Portland. Outlying encampments, eight between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., certain areas, encampments are illegal. All right. These laws were deliberately written in part to target Roma populations, traditionally unhoused, and are now disproportionately applied to non-Danish homeless people. A homeless person refusing government-provided housing on the basis that it's not my home would garner little to no sympathy here. That's the point they're trying to make. That, who, who cares? If you're getting free housing, this is what you get. 
beggars can't be choosers, right? So you've got that whole thing. So that is a really interesting perspective from somebody in Denmark. I don't think Janosko's attitude will garner much sympathy here either. Yeah, in the US, it doesn't. I have zero sympathy. As the old saying goes, yeah, beggars can't be choosers. Another reader pointed out that living in a city means making certain compromises, not just making endless demands on everyone around you who are paying the bills. But we've created this society where these people, you know, and they've got activists talking in their ear going, oh, you should sue. You should sue. This is violating your constitutional rights. You should sue. You should sue. For those of us living nearby, the plain fact is that these encampments are not safe. In addition to the fires and sanitation issues, yeah, there are issues with violence and spiraling addiction. I get the frustration with all the rules of society, the inequality, the unfairness, and no doubt the history of trauma. Yeah, a lot of these people have mental issues. Something tweaked them. They turn to drugs because they're trying to self-medicate. Here we are, right? But to live in close quarters to a city means uh, uh, making certain compromises. The rest of us do. And with all the public assistance, it's reasonable to expect that those who are struggling with housing to do the same. They make zero compromises. Zero compromises. When they get bounced out of an encampment, they just haul their crap down the street to where, you know, they know they're going to be able to set up. I watch it happen time and time and time again. Mayor Bruce Harrell, he is doing some sweeps. I mean, it is an endless rinse and repeat, right? Because until you get these people squared away, that's what you're going to be doing. But at least he's doing that. Now, you might say, well, okay, he's doing that to the areas of town that have the highest tax base. And so then, you know, Jonathan Cho here in Seattle is highlighting what's happening on Leary Way in Ballard. It's a major thoroughfare. I think he did uh, a count where he counted 30 something tents within, you know, walking, short walking distance in a pretty packed in area. So, you know, when you bounce people out of these encampments, they, they go somewhere, the whole whack-a-mole, right? What do you do with people who'd rather live in their own filth than without, uh, uh, than live without drugs? What do you do with those folks is the next question. A bit of speculation here, but I would guess many of the unhoused people are not easy to mainstream for a huge range of reasons, including that they don't want to be. Mm, That is 100% correct. They don't want to be. They're not ready for treatment. They're just not. They want to keep doing what they're doing. So what does society do with someone who doesn't want to or can't manage to be sober, who can't maintain a job? who wants to live close to people who make their day-to-day more tolerable with drugs, even if it's dangerous and makes kicking bad habits hard and or kills you, right? I mean, we got a fentanyl crisis right in front of our faces, right in front of our faces. Whoa, what, what fentanyl issue? With that um, podcast that I did on the exploding homeless encampment where there was smoking fentanyl, can't tell you how many comments I've had where, Yeah, I I haven't heard of smoking fentanyl. I mean, it comes in pill form and it comes in powder form, but I I, I think you must be, you know, misunderstood there. They're they're not smoking fentanyl. Really? Really? Is that why Multnomah County was going to hand out however many thousands of dollars of tinfoil and straws to smoke it? As part of harm reduction, all harm, no reduction. Is that why? I mean, we're no longer handing out needles. We're handing out tinfoil. So it's a thing. So, so many people have that, you know, fentanyl crisis is right in front of their noses. Smoking fentanyl? What do you mean? I mean, this is like within the last couple of days since I released that video, which I think was Sunday, um, you know, whatever is it, 28th of, uh, of July. And people are literally like, I've, smoking fentanyl isn't a thing. Really? Huh. How about all the stories I've done of bus drivers going to the hospital because of the toxic fumes from their riders smoking fentanyl in the bus? Yeah, people don't want to, they don't want to face reality. Smoking fentanyl, that's that's not a thing. Okay, all right. There is a different problem than the family forced out onto the street due to the lack of savings or losing a job. All right, so we've identified the drug addict who doesn't want to get sober. The article is stating now, this is a different problem than the family forced onto the street due to lack of savings or losing a job. 
Unfortunately, the two very different situations, which require very different responses, get lumped together. They do. But I feel like I read enough stories and enough interviews are done where if somebody really wants to take advantage of resources, they are out there. You just got to work it. But a heavily involved drug addict does not have life skills to do that. They're not in a position where they can do that. Because the minute they don't have that stuff in their system, you know, they start to Jones and they, you know, go into the detox and they get sick. They can't function. So, you know, families that experience homelessness, wildly different than the folks that we're talking about that are the massive component that is what makes up the the people in these homeless encampments. Plain and simple. The down on on their luck, sober people, I mean, how many instances have we seen where that's been a thing? Um, The article finishes up with, Oakland was right about uh, to shut this thing down this camp. California cities should continue shutting down any camps that pop up and force people living in them into safer, more controlled alternatives. Okay, how are you going to do that? I agree. I agree 100%. How are you going to do that? How are you going to force people into doing something that they don't want to do? We can't incarcerate, we can't incarcerate them because they, you know, based on the laws of these cities, they're not doing anything illegal and to get them into treatment, you can't force them there and you can't force them into getting mental health care either. So how do you force them into more safe controlled alternatives? That's the rub, right? People like John Janosko shouldn't be allowed to live like wild animals, even if they say that's what they want. We simply don't owe anyone the right to treat public property as their personal drug den slash open sewer. 100% agreed. 100% agreed. But how do we get from that statement? We don't owe anyone the right to treat public property as their personal drug den slash open sewer. How do we get that to... You know, these these folks squared away to the point where that's not a thing. How do we make that happen? That's that's where I am like, mm, this ain't happening anytime soon. You've got some massive institutional stuff to work on before you get to even starting on any of this. We've allowed this to happen. And specifically, this has been allowed to happen in liberal left-leaning cities. Let's be honest. I try and not to politicize this stuff, but that's the harsh reality. And I live in Seattle, which, as you know, is not exactly a Republican, conservative, or even a reasonable type <laughs> type city as far as its politics go. There are areas of Seattle where you would be shocked at, um, and, and the burbs are, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is that is the true urban areas. That's where these people tend to, tend to congregate and tend to vote and tend to do all that stuff. And that's what we're talking about. That is where these encampments are in a city like Seattle. They're not, they're not in Bellevue and we're just a handful of miles away. We don't have any, there are no encampments. And homeless here get swept hard and we push them to get help. And if we don't, you know, they get moved, they get moved. Seattle, they're doing the best they can. Mayor Harrell, I believe is doing the best he can to, 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 to do what he needs to do. But until you come up with some of these solutions, I think you've just got, this is, this is the way it is for a long time moving forward. I wish I had better, you know, insight and I wish I had better, uh, outlook but the amount of resources it's going to take to get these people the help that they need to get them off the streets out of the encampments man because these people are far gone if you haven't been to a homeless encampment i mean it is something else you've always got somebody just screaming at the trees screaming at the clouds walking around just they're mentally you know incapacitated from either whatever trauma they've got or the drugs they're taking, and oftentimes it's a combination. So, you know, is this going to, is, is there a magic fix? Absolutely not. You don't have one because what it's going to take is huge amounts of resources and then the political will of the people to say, you know what? 
Yeah, that whole decriminalize everything thing, that did not work out. Good Lord, that went sideways. That went sideways. What are we going to do? And that's exactly where we sit right now. What are we going to do? That's what we're trying to figure out. And by we, I mean cities all across the U.S. that have allowed this to happen. What are we going to do? Yeah. I mean, now when you come up with something. All right. Meantime, I'll be covering it here for you on News for Reasonable People. Thanks so much for being here. I'll catch up with you on the next one. Bye for now.